Ready when you are. Oh, one, two, three. Hi, I'm Mark from Periphery. And I'm Jake from Periphery, and you're listening to Lean Your Rock. Hi, Jake. Hi, Mark from Periphery. Welcome to Linear Rock. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Such a great pleasure to have you back. Uh, we interviewed Misha 12 years ago. So long, oh long, That's a long time, time ago. Yeah. 12 years ago. Wow. Yeah. First time in Italy, opening for Dream Theater. So, Ooh. yeah. Wow. Long, long time wow. ago. Yeah. He, he was still a very young guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> only, at, only at heart. Yeah. We're all falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tonight you're playing Milan, a sold-out gig, so congrats on that. Thank you. Thank um, you. There's, you know, a lot of um, interest around the band also in Italy, so I'm happy about it. So cool. it's 20 years of periphery, uh, pretty much. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, it is already 2004, so it's 20 years oh, yeah, uh, yeah. since the band very first started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, tours are some way an acid test, let's say. Uh, you can touch, you know, firsthand, step by step, uh, how big it gets your audience and how it changes through the years. You know, what kind of people comes to your shows and listen to your music. Have you noticed any significant changes so far uh, in your fan base in recent years? Yeah, I mean, I think like the nice part about it is like historically we've been a band that primarily like male it's like a male dominated audience. And like lately it's been expanding out in all directions. So like, you know, we have a way more diverse listener base than, than we've ever had. So it's, it's really nice to kind of see that the music is, is reaching more and more people as we get older. And it also feels like, you know, sometimes we come back to a place like Milan, for example, like Italy in general, where we don't play very often, you know, we'll play like I was yeah. telling someone earlier, we played here seven years ago, I yeah. think. As hard as that is to believe, seven years ago, yet we play so rarely, yet the crowds seem to get bigger every time, which is, it always catches us by surprise, you know, because yeah. uh, sometimes you you have to pour more attention into a certain city, to a certain country, to a certain market to see those crowds grow. But a place like Italy has always been great to us from the start, ever since, you know, the years that you were just talking about, yeah. the Dream Theater tour. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's a lot going on, you know, in peripheries, music sphere. Um, you're very prolific uh, and unpredictable as well. Uh, how do you maintain, you know, the perfect balance between the more is more and less is more <laughs> at the same time um, feeling and attitude? And how much is it about, you know, natural instinct, what you do, or there's a logical reasoning uh, which takes part in your complex and multi-layered uh, style? Spencer has, you know, Spencer has the more is more, you know, with the, that quote, Ingve Malmsteen, yeah. why, how can less be more? More is more. <laughs> more is more. Yeah. Yeah. more, yeah. is more. Yeah. That's that, whole, that was the only thing I was thinking about right. <laughs> <laughs> just then. Um, yeah. Our singer yeah. Spencer actually has that tattooed on his arm. All right. Really? Uh, I didn't more. know about it. Yeah, <laughs> more is more. Yeah. Um, but but and to answer your question, I, I don't think it's calculated at all for us. It's just uh, making music and writing music is very subconscious and it's a byproduct of being close to each other as human beings. Um, there's never a discussion about, you know, let's cram as many notes as possible. This needs to be notier, this needs to be crazier. It's just a byproduct of, of who we are and who we grew up listening to. Like we did this thing the other day where we listed all the bands that we grew up listening to. And if you were to throw out all those bands and do a bucket, you know, the Meshuggahs and the Devin Townsends, the Opeths, the, you know, whatever, the list goes on and on and on. That's kind of what comes out and there's no real, um, calculation about it you know yeah, sometimes i think about the way that we write stuff together and it, it's never deliberate it, it a lot of times like it'll just stuff will just be produced just by nature of us being in a room together and i think it's kind of a it's a bit of a magical thing and 
even sometimes, uh, you know, going, going even further than that, sometimes like we'll just be laughing about something and we'll put like a joke section into a song we're working on. And then some like Misha's like, I bet I can make this cool. And then like, that's how, that's where a lot of like our more like wild or kind of experimental things come from. So it's like, do, as Mark said, because we've been together for so long and we just have like this implicit trust with one another, it's almost like all we have to do is be in proximity and like, periphery makes music it's it's very it's very cool and we're very very lucky about that bucket you were mentioning you know mm. throwing everything inside you know about your influences which is the most guilty guilty pleasure in that bucket that you know we cannot expect t-swift no i'm just kidding i'm not a swifty <laughs> you're kind of a swifty a little bit yeah a little bit of a yeah. swifty girlfriend's making me a swifty yeah, yeah. What's the yeah. guilty? What are other guilty pleasures in that book? I don't know. I never really liked that term. Like I feel yeah. like I, you know, I don't. I I'm not ashamed of anything that I listen to, and I never feel guilty about. It. Like I think like maybe uh, unexpected. Yeah. Probably like uh, I think um, what a lot of people don't realize is, and I'm I I can't say this with a hundred percent certainty, but I don't think like metal is everyone's primary thing that they listen to. Everyone has like uh, various uh, music tastes and, and it kind of goes well beyond the scope of metal. Obviously it kind of coalesces in periphery as metal, but what you're hearing is just a amalgam of just like tons of different styles and bands and uh, inside jokes and all kinds of stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to say. I mean, um, I guess from my, like where I come from, I could say that electronic music is probably what I listen to the most. And, there's so many obscure artists in, in my like Spotify, for example, that no one has ever heard of, but those influences are definitely finding their way into Periphery's music. And, and, uh, I think that's cool. I think Mark probably could say the same about the stuff that he listens to. Same. Yeah. yeah. Same with, you know, yeah. if you, there was a playlist going on backstage, you wouldn't be shocked to hear like, you know, Prince or whatever, like Michael Jack's eighties music. It's just like all of it's welcome. You know, we listen to all of it. Our singer has very eclectic taste too. It's all over the map, you know, and very rarely is, is our backstage music, you know, metal. Yeah. It's always something kind of opposite, you know? So that's why sometimes, you know, a sax solo pops up like in wildfire. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or the electronic <laughs> stuff that, that Jake brings to the band. It's like, that's Jake's world, and every time you hear that in our sound, chances are Jake had something uh, I love to that. do with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you are perceived, you know, as a prog metal core band, pretty much from from the audience, uh, with a deep gen tendency. But gen is not a genre, as you stated. So, um, you know, the title of Periphery Five actually. Uh, is, you know, a clear message about the fact that you don't like definitions and your music, you know, states it as well. Um, do you follow a sort of diktat, you know, uh, which does not necessarily mean that you can always meet fans' expectations and please, you know, please them uh, all the time? But have you ever felt, in a sense, trapped in your own mechanism, you know, the fact of being so brave and, you know, dare so much, um, you actually chose, you know, this path, but you spoiled maybe the audience a bit with that. <laughs> I, I think like uh, we never, I think we, we, we're not trying to deliberately alienate our audience at any time. Like, obviously we want to, we hope that the music that we get to create together is well received. <laughs> But it's not like we won't write something uh, uh, controversial or diverse and then worry about what the fans think about it. It's it's kind of like if we wrote a song that we all feel really good about, that's kind of where that stops. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, it, it's not it's not we don't do anything deliberate like that. Yeah, we, I, I can't say that we've ever once. And OK, so I'll say this, but let me preface it by saying that we love our fans and we adore our fans and we would be absolutely nothing without them. Um, they're the reasons that we do what we do without them, without them. Again, we'd be at home, um, in our sweatpants, but, um, 
we never think about them. We can't like we can't think about our fans when we write music because it's just too much of a mind game, you know, okay. because then you start to think about where does this fit in? Will they like this? Will they like me? Will they love us? You know, it's like the, the list of questions is endless um, when you start asking yourself these things. And um, and for us, I, and, I, and I think the same goes for most artists out there. I think you have to shut all that noise out, you know, um, for us, it's never really been a question. You know, it's very, the process of creation is very insular. It's in our own bubble. And, um, and, and I think the feeling of not being trapped is the reason we still keep doing this. You know, um, I think if we ever felt trapped in, in a specific box, uh, it would be very boring very quickly, you know? Um, yeah. One other thing I want to add is like in the age of the internet, you can find a contrary opinion to like anything that you do. <laughs> Like, no matter what you're doing, you're doing something wrong yeah. to someone. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, that's kind of what I think is hilarious about, like, people are like, you know, well, here's my opinion on your band, and here's why you should be doing that stuff. And then right next to that guy is the ap yep. the opposite opinion. It's like, okay, who do we listen to here? Like, yeah. so you, that's why you can't, you know, mm. and, and, and most, I, I, I think as you get older, you kind of realize that. Um, but I think generally that tends to be like more of like a young person sort of. Thing that they do and uh eventually they realize it's like well they can't listen to all of us otherwise it'll just get chaos yeah. and about the working process you know composing wise um do you follow a standard process in your unpredictability let's say and do you work separately pretty much all the time to be able to express your in individuality you know in the name of the collective you know, to put then everything together and pick the best uh, of it. Um, I'm thinking, you know, you know, a striking example is the concept which each of you worked on a song, uh, on each song separately, if I'm correct. Oh, that's clear. You're thinking of clear. That we had an album called Clear. Okay, that's each clear. One of us, yeah, okay. that's clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that was in my mind, you know, when I when I thought about that, you mm -hmm. know, the fact, is that a standard for you to work separately or you don't have any standard and, and you know, whatever happens? I, I think one of the constants of our band is that we're always working. I don't even think of it as work. Like we're always creating on our own at home. It's part of who we are as people. Um, you know, I'm always, I'm always playing guitar, always. Jake's always working on music that's either his solo stuff or ends up becoming periphery or his other project with, okay. with Misha. So, and the same goes for everybody else in the band. The creation is always going forward in the band, all five of us. Um, so that's a constant and it doesn't always feel like work. It's just part of the daily routine. Um, but we always say that the true writing, the true creation in the periphery process doesn't actually begin until we're all in the same room. Okay. That's when it all starts to happen. Um, and with that process, there's always going to be ideas that already exist, you know, like example number one, um, Jake had a song that he started working on and on his own for Periphery 5, but it was, he finished the idea sort of too close to the end of Periphery 5. The album was already like basically done, but now we have a kick-ass song ready to go for the next <laughs> record. Um, and that's just the kind of accidents you walk into. You know, these are the best kinds of gifts you're handed when everybody is always writing, is always creative. Accidents happen uh, and, and these beautiful things are created out of them without us even trying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. And self-producing uh, has always been an essential condition for you guys. Um, to, is that to keep control or... Is actually like you never thought, you know, you actually have a producer, which is Adam Getgood, which is at your side, by your side, uh, pretty much all the time since the second album, if I'm correct. I just want to I want to make a quick uh, uh, just a thing about that. So like everybody's a producer in the mm -hmm. band and actually Nolly doesn't really he produces match drums. But as far as like the like the head producer, if there is one in the band, which it really isn't, it would probably be Misha. Um, Misha kind of handles all of the, uh, um, sort of organizational stuff and, you know, he's recording me and Mark as we play guitar and sometimes we record ourselves, but, uh, it's just a little, it's qu a little bit different. So, um, I just wanted to make that distinction. Uh, 
But why him, you know, is the perfect person in that role? And why Nolly? Um, well, Misha has always kind of been the principal songwriter of Peru. No, no, I don't mean Misha. I mean Adam first. Oh, you know, him. Adam. Oh, That's uh, why Nolly. I was asking, why uh, Nolly? <laughs> so we've known Nolly forever. He's been a close associate of the band even before he was in Periphery. He's toured with us. He's kind of just been like a good friend. And um, he, he was always a guitar player first. And um, he, he's a fantastic guitar player. And uh, when there was a vacancy on bass, he decided to pick up the bass. And he taught himself how to play the bass to to be able to play in periphery. So it kind of speaks to his uh, level of uh, uh, musical ability because, you know, starting a new instrument from scratch is never easy. But because he had all of ex his experience with guitar and producing his own stuff, he, he was able to kind of slide into the role pretty pretty easily. Um, and then during Periphery 2, which uh, uh, Misha and Nolly worked really close together to kind of get what you ended up hearing on the record, um, Nolly had to teach himself Pro Tools, uh, which he uses Logic, which mm -hmm. is a, a different thing. Yeah. And um, uh, he decided that he wanted to pursue it more to where he could actually become like a full-fledged music producer and engineer. So, um, so yeah, he, he's definitely produced and engineered uh, a, a ton of bands and it's kind of like a sound that people really look for now. Um, he's, he's very in demand for kind of what he brings to the table. And, um, you know, that's, that's why we like working with him. Cause he gets, he gets a drum sound and a bass tone that is, uh, very uniquely his. And, uh, I think, uh, I think people really like it. And about Misha, which you were mentioning, he actually founded the band and uh, he, f he found you guys. Um, how did, did he approach you uh, back then? And, uh, you know, how, how the, the chain of command is developing in everything periphery? Is Misha like the undisputed boss and has always the last say on everything? How does it work? Well, he found us on Tinder. Right? No, I'm just kidding. Grindr. Grindr. Sorry, sorry, Grindr. Grindr. Um, no, so to, to address your question, there is no boss of periphery. Okay. It's a complete and utter democracy. Um, there's no final say. The final say is really five people. Um, and that makes things always very simple. Um, we met Misha very happenstance. Uh, Jake met him online uh what mid 2000s yeah. uh yeah it was like 2004 2005 yeah. something like that yeah, yeah. and it's just forged off of a friendship and I, I was the same way I, I met him in the local washington dc music scene on on, okay. on myspace if you remember myspace yes um yeah long time ago <laughs> good old myspace yeah um and that's that's where we all sort of became friends first and foremost and then uh and then you know and we started building things from there but uh but yeah, every, the, the, the beautiful thing about Periphery is that uh, everyone's equal. Everyone's equally invested across the board, when it, whether it comes to songwriting, tours, uh, the business yeah. side of things, finances, everything, delegating the most random tasks, um, you know, all things um, within the band. So, um, so yeah, it makes for a very um, healthy relationship across the board. And, and I know ever since day one, it's why our lineup has been so stable since Periphery 2. You know, it's just everybody's on equal footing. Um, everybody's voice has the same volume. Everybody's um, share in what we do is equal. So, um, yeah. So you did the opposite path. I mean, not being friends and then co forming yeah. a band, yeah. but becoming friends, mm -hmm. sharing a vision. Uh, yeah. That affected, in a sense, your... Uh, you're growing, do you think? Uh, was it any different than maybe any other experience you had before, you know, in other bands? Yeah, I mean, one thing to note is that Misha was, he founded the band. And so by all rights, he could have been the guy mm -hmm. that's like, all right, we're going to do things my way. You could be a part of it if you want to. Yeah. But I think he had the foresight and the vision to see like, well, if I'm going to be in a band with, with these guys, I want them to feel like they have a stake in it, like they have, you know, ownership. And then that way it kind of takes the pressure off of him to kind of be like the sole sort of authority. And he also, you know, you create a sense of, uh, 
uh, fellowship or like brotherhood because everyone feels invested in the in the project. And um, I really uh, I respected that sort of way of thinking from him because uh, it could have you know he, he he could write all the music himself if he wanted to, mm. um, but he wanted to make sure that you know he was in a band and not the Misha project. And uh, it's it's something I really respect about him. But he's marked. He he has you know he has you and <laughs> yeah, you are <laughs> such great musicians as well. Thanks. Would be a pity you know <laughs> not to take advantage of it. Um, uh, you have a clear mind, as we already spoke about. Uh, you know what you want, and you take no prisoners and no compromise. And and people buys it actually. Um, Periphery, I must say, is the smartest band in metal. Thank you. <laughs> Not only for that, for the sound, you know, the music that uh, that you produce, but also, you know, um, talking about the system that gravitates around the band, talking about your own label, software companies, parallel activities, mm-hmm. you know, such as, um, you know, VIP lessons or... Uh, clinics, mm-hmm. you do a lot of stuff. Uh, was this as well a plan since day one when you joined um, or, or actually it came, you know, through the process? No, none of it. I mean, I, personally speaking, and I can't speak for, you know, Misha back in the day or the rest of the guys, but I, I don't think it was ever a plan. It was just, I think, Maybe out of necessity, you know, because well, yeah. for COVID and, you know, everything else. <laughs> yeah, the, the culture that you just described in our band started a long time ago. Like, I mean, 20, 2010, 2011, I can remember, you know, guys like our drummer, Matt, being very active in the lesson world. And, you know, discussions about software companies began yeah. years after that. But um, I, I just think there's we have personalities in this band that instead of touring 10 months out of the year, nine months out of the year, we would much rather ramp down on the touring and do it strategically and sparingly and instead focus our energies on on other things that allow yeah. us to have more balanced lives, more fulfilled lives. Um, and that, that's not for every band, um, but, uh, but for us personally, I know it's, it's, it's fulfilling to have things going concurrently on the side of the band. And, and yeah, like you said, I mean, for us, Um, especially in the early days, I remember doing these long tours, five, six week long tours and coming home and looking at my bank account and just being so depressed, yeah. you know? Uh, and that's, you can say whatever you want. You can, you can make fun of touring all you want. You can make fun of lifestyle all you want, but that sucks as an adult male, yeah. female, whatever, as an adult person to yeah. get home and look at your bank account and be like, Oh my God, like I, We played like 35 shows in 39 days and I'm, you know, $12,000 $12, in debt. That feeling sucks. Um, and so there's a million ways to go about touring in a more strategic way. But, but just as importantly, there's nothing wrong with, you know, trying to pave your own way on the side to see if you can actually turn this into a viable uh, lifestyle, a, a viable living. I, I think you make the fans happier because you're able to Yeah. have a career longer we weren't able to do these things on the side i mean like who knows what where periphery would be I, i i don't even know if we'd be a band because we'd be freaking broke you know so uh it's it's all really just to have its career longer and if people are along for the ride with us then then that's great then it works both ways you know and you must have a, a very strict schedule because you have to coordinate everything and you know does this take maybe some time off the band or uh Or you deal with it, you know, the best way. Everything's spread out nicely throughout the year. Uh, we, we started doing this thing uh, quite a few years back with our manager, Wayne, where we do a weekly call. And so that kind of organizes things for us in, uh, you know, we basically plan out the year. And then as these things start coming up, we, you know, we'll reference them on the call and we'll talk about details. And that kind of keeps us like very organized and also we have a sense of where things are going to happen so then when we're working on our things that we do on the side it's easy to kind of fit them into the spots where we know okay. periphery isn't going to be working on stuff um we tend to prioritize periphery because i think we all look forward to being together and writing music together so 
obviously that's and that's also kind of like the uh, the center of gravity for everything that we do so you know it's it's nice to have that and it makes it so it's not this thing where we we're constantly feeling crunched on time and uh it it supports everything that we do we always like to say that periphery we want periphery to be the big fun explosive explosive passion project we want periphery to be purely for fun yeah. we don't ever want to look at periphery as you know nine to five clock in clock out every day <laughs> like and, and i think that's why periphery is what it is hopefully that's why people latch on to it that's why they can relate because for us it's it's a blast you know it's it's the time of our lives creating the music touring playing the music every night you can see like we don't stand there you know looking like cavemen all angry we're, we're smiling and we're joking and we're having fun because it's fun and i think we've 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 really worked at that over the years to make periphery something fun as opposed to like oh god here we go clock in i hate this life you know it's like it can't ever be that and the moment it starts to be that that's when we uh, yeah sign yeah. on it's when you stop yeah. yeah so you said you have some ideas already in in the can for the next record which i suppose would be periphery six yeah. uh, maybe it's maybe who knows okay yeah. but you stated also that the writing and recording process for periphery five took far longer than any of the previous albums and that you know that translated um in growing even closer as a band will this affect some way the next album uh heavily uh what do you think do you have an idea and do you know already when it will happen We don't know when, but we do have an idea of how we want to approach. Uh, we've actually been talking about it quite a bit on this tour just because I think everybody is uh, on the same page as usual with us. We, we always kind of like, you know, when we're looking to the future, it's always kind of it's it's kind of eerie how similar we're all kind of thinking about stuff. Um, so, yeah, we have an idea of where we're going to go, but it it's not like what I think anybody can predict. So, mm. um We'll see how we'll see how it shapes up. But I, but I know that, like, I think the fun part of it is that it's we're going to go into this and, and, and try to challenge ourselves. And, and I know this sounds all vague and like <laughs> musician buzzwords and stuff. But no, it's like we actually kind of have a, a pretty strong idea of how we want to approach the next writing uh, sessions. And, and it is heavily informed by what we did on Periphery 5, but not maybe not in the way that you might think. And we don't know what it's going to be yet. Who knows? Yeah. Periphery 6, uh, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, Chinese democracy, too. <laughs> yeah. We came up with a good uh, Periphery 6 title today. What was that? Periphery 6. Periphery 6. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that'd, that'd piss a lot of people off. That would make a lot of people upset. Or, yeah. or, or psych, Jen, Jen is a genre. <laughs> Jen is a genre. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. The yeah. fact of using numbers, you know, is that to give a chronological progression like chapters to a story or uh, it simply happened like that, that? That wasn't the plan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think there was like a um, resistance to doing that at first. Mm -hmm. I remember when it came when we were working on Periphery 2, we were struggling for ideas mm. and we just were like, let's just call it. Prefer two. This time it's personal. You know, it's a cliche movie sequel thing. And then we had no choice but to run with it. Like you can't just stop at two and then like not do that anymore. So yeah, I, I don't know why it's there, but I think it's just because like we can't change it now. So we're locked into this uh sequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We should just skip a number. <laughs> yeah. you know? What happened to Periphery? <laughs> Chicken Foot did that. You oh, know, really? they did Chicken Foot 3 before the second one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it was. Oh, yeah. so we'd be ripping their idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We go to zero. Resident <laughs> Evil Zero. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so you have three guitars. Um, and, you know, you have a strongly, very defined guitar tone in your sound. Um, which is a sort of, it, it's the spine of your arrangements. How do you s decide, you know, who plays what and how do you actually puzzle it in the studio and also composing wise? And the no bass, you know, question, <laughs> at least officially, you don't have a bass player. You, you do have bass uh, in, in your records, on your records, but live It's it's a different story. Uh, was this as well a precise choice? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so our bass player is uh, is named Mac, mm -hmm. Mac, Mac Book. Mr. Book. Mr. Book. <laughs> yeah. um, well, Book is his middle name, I think. Pro <laughs> oh, yeah. is his last name. <laughs> Mac, <Yeah>. Mac, <laughs> Mac Book Pro. Um, no, um, yeah, it's, it's a really simple answer to, to, to your first question. Um, mm -hmm. In the studio, whoever writes the part plays the part. Okay. So there is no, like, you know, Jake writes a riff. There's not even a question of me or Misha playing it. Jake's going to record it because it'll take him two minutes versus... You know, okay. having to learn it and learn yeah. it the exactly. way that we play it and all that yeah. stuff. It's just uh, more streamlined. And then live, it's also pretty simple because so Jake is panned down the center of the live mix. I'm panned down stage right. Misha's mm -hmm. panned down stage left. So Misha and I tend to get a lot of the same parts, like these parts that kind of lock into each other. And then Jake, uh, he has a lot of the sort of the parts that like stick out above the mix, whether they're lead parts, ambient parts. Uh, he has a lot of crazy parts. In it. Anytime I solo his channel, I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you're just soloing over every song. It's like crazy. You get all these counterpoint things yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and leads and, and clean passages and, and guitar solos. and and But like the, the nice part about it, though, is like we'll switch it up. Sometimes mm -hmm. Mark will do that stuff. Sometimes Misha will do that stuff. Sometimes we're all doing something completely different and so it's kind of that's kind of the fun part of uh of having three guitar players yeah and w which is your favorite guitar player of all time do you have different ones or do you actually share a vision on that as well i know jake you go ahead yeah mine's dimebag uh, yeah okay. yeah no, it's always always been dimebag um yeah I'm probably james hatfield number one but like Right below is, is maybe Randy Rhodes. If we're talking about all time, because yes. Randy Rhodes made me like level up as a musician when I was obsessed with him. So yeah, but Hatfield, Hatfield, I think let's just say Hatfield. Yeah, you know, yeah. Hatfield, yeah. such a great rhythm and not only guitar player. I know. You know, he's the best man. Yeah, he's and amazing. He's still great. He's still great. Pretty much as Malcolm Young in ACDC, you know, he stepped behind, but mm -hmm. it he was yeah he was the sound, you know. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. Um, about the frontman karma, let's call it like that. You changed quite a few singers through the years. I counted four, if I'm correct. Um, was that more a matter, you know, of human element, or you know, there were like creative differences, and you changed so much? Uh, I think like creative differences was like a nice way to. <laughs> is like a nice way to put that there there were just like some things that just didn't mesh well with the band um other train tracks no sorry <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, <laughs> um yeah it's just uh you know it, it and it should be said that all this stuff happened in, like even before the first album came out spencer's been our singer since the first album and i always kind of consider him like you know peripheries only singer but i know what you mean like there are there is evidence that we had previous singers yeah. and um uh the one i want to make a special note of is casey sable because his we're still friends with casey to this day uh and casey's input early on really changed the direction of the band and the sound of the band and in fact uh, a little little tidbit about the history is that uh, we got this other guy, Chris, and when Casey found out, because Casey had already left the band, and when mm -hmm. Casey found out, he's like, no, 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 you need to get this guy Spencer. And he was like all mad at us. He was just like, you should get Spencer Satella. Like, I'm telling you, this is, you asked, because we asked him for his input and everything, and he, you know, he was just like really advocating for Spencer and like, nah, we got Chris. And then Chris like didn't work out at all and uh and we immediately hired spencer we were like we should have listened to you casey sorry <laughs> <laughs> is the vocals usually the last thing you add to uh, to the songs and do you think maybe it's difficult for a singer to approach your style that's maybe the reason why it wasn't so you know easy to find the right person yeah i mean the, the vocals I, i'd say are probably uh the hardest part of any song because they're really the thing that you're going to hear above all else and you know they can really make or break a band and and i we have some ideas where vocals already existed for them and then we like kind of write around them but it's it's pretty rare it will usually construct a song with spencer he'll be there and he'll be kind of like telling us which 
which which parts are the verses and the choruses and you know a lot of the time because he's a vocalist he looks at these songs in a completely different context and that will make the songs change shape so um so yeah there used to be this joke in the band like with three guitar players like we're kind of we're taking up all the notes you know like there are our first instinct as guitarists is to always you know like yeah this is going to be fun let's let's make riffs 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 notes and riffs and notes and riffs and then there's, you know, Spencer would always be like, well, where do I sing? Like, there's just, you took all the notes. Um, and it's taken us many albums to to learn how to do this uh, in a very harmonious way. And I think we've been, we've been good at it for a while with Spencer. And I think the key is always just to involve him very early in the songwriting process. Oh. Um, and that way, we're not writing these guitar arrangements you know, we're writing songs with vocals in mind from the very beginning. And that's why I, I, I really look back on Periphery 1 and Periphery 2 as being very tough on Spencer. Um, all the credit in the world to him for 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 making those records really good uh, in terms of his performance. Because he was writing vocals to songs that were full arrangements, like guitar-wise, instrumental arrangements that were already in some way kind of finished or thought of as finished by the band and then he just kind of came in and, and added his vocals over it which is really hard to do mm. if you want to make a cohesive vocal arrangement um so yeah i mean it's 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 a it's a it's a minor miracle for me that those that those performances turned out great considering how hard that must have been for him as a vocalist yeah mm -hmm. you've always been a step ahead and still are um you used AI to make Atropos video about AI. Uh, what do you think, you know, about the use and, in, in a sense, abuse, you know, of this technology in music? We already have ABBA and Elvis doing shows with AI. We have the Kiss avatars in the making, which will be ready in 2027. So it will take long. But it seems, you know, that it's just the tip of the iceberg in a future which is not so far away. So you talked about it. I mean, you expressed it in your video. But what is your feeling about it? Will it be something good or it will actually become something you know not so good we're looking at each other it's a hot <laughs> that's a, yeah that's that's <laughs> you just asked a a very very difficult yeah. question um i mean i think it could it, it could go one of two ways it could be kind of like this is this is a fad and and people will eventually learn how to harness the technology to be uh, like useful and helpful and not like a novelty which right now it's just it's a novelty yeah and it, you know it but it is uh you know it's almost like you can see the writing on the wall where this is going to go where like it's going to kind of blur the line between like what's uh what's uh you know true human output versus you know some sort of um artificial amalgam of uh, all the stuff that this thing parses online because that's essentially what it's doing it's just grabbing all of the information it can from these different you know repositories of of stuff and and it's assembling it in a way that makes sense to humans so it's just uh you know i think uh, i think it's going to take some time before it becomes an actual problem but um, it was fun to experiment with it with the music video because we saw kind of a proof of concept uh, video from our friend who who made that video, and we we're like, this is cool. Let's let's just let's just see what we can come up with. And and it was kind of like a it was pretty uh, divisive amongst our fans because like some people think that it's like plagiarism, and some people are fine with it. And like I don't care either way like you know that's you want to talk about plagiarism i mean like we have we have to adapt our careers because people can just download and listen to music wherever they would so that's why we have side projects it's signature gear and we're always like trying yeah. things so it's just like this has been happening forever and i don't think this is going to be some sort of profound thing that makes that much of a difference because people will learn how to adapt to it but you know I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, so I'm going to stop here. But that's kind of uh, 
That's kind of how I feel about it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you well, want to add something, Mark? Uh, Jake said it very succinctly and perfectly. I, yeah, it's amazing. I don't really have much of an opinion about it because I don't, you know, I know like Jake said, it's it's very new and it's a Pandora's box kind of thing. And, you know, if if we give in to our worst fears about it, it spells something catastrophic. But... Uh, there, there's a lot of things about that that we've dealt with, like Jake said, in the music industry, and we're kind of having to adapt to on the fly. And we've yeah. had to mold our careers, um, you know, to to kind of roll with everything. So, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think from the very beginning, we were given an idea from our director, and it looked very cool to us, and it seemed very cool. We were stoked with the video. And then, um, you know, most of our fans were, in, were into it. They, they liked it. It was, it was for a song that went across well um, also. So... Um, there was a vocal minority, a very vocal minority, um, which I understand their views as well. But for us, at the end of the day, we were just trying to make a music video. You know, that's it. So, will you? Would you ever go to see Abba or Kiss? You know, as avatars is something that you would experience, or uh... I don't know about. It. I, I could get guest list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do I that's talk to the AI point. about that? <laughs> <laughs> would you see, yeah, yeah it's like. Know. Dear AI, can I have guest list? It's like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird concept. I'm like, maybe this concept uh, would be cool. I don't know. I'm like, I'm, maybe we're... The technology is like, it's too new. I, 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 yeah. I don't know if it would actually be, you know, like close enough to the real thing. If somebody said that I could see, you know, like, like Prime Queen, Freddie Mercury Queen AI live at Wembley you know, stadium, yeah. front row. Yeah, I would, but I don't know what that would be like. Like, yeah. would it be Uncanny Valley? Would it be creepy? Would Freddie Mercury's eyes not, like, like would they be <laughs> Like a ghost, everywhere? you yeah. know, maybe, yeah, too, like, you know, too close, maybe you yeah. can see him. Like the Will Smith eating pasta thing. <laughs> like, because like, there's really creepy examples of AI uh, um, showing you things that you don't want to see. But it, I think if it hits a point where it's like there's no difference between what you think you would be and what you're actually seeing, then it, it, maybe I would start to be more on board with it. But right now it's still in this place where it just like kind of makes me laugh. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. So which is your, the next goal, you know, set for, uh, you know, to, to make periphery and be part of it, you know, a constant, exciting challenge. Hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously start working on new music. I know that's kind of a boring answer, but it's uh, something I'm, I'm really looking forward to with the guys. And um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I think we've been a band for so long that in the past, you could have asked me what the future would look like, and I would hope that it would look like exactly what it looks like right now. But now asking that question, like, I don't know. I don't, you know, uh, how many more years does the band have? I don't know. How many more albums are we going to write? I don't know. So it's like pretty exciting. Yes, you're very young. You're still you're in your heydays. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say like physically we're young, but like as bands like get past that 15 year mark, you know, mm. it's like, what are, the, what are they supposed to do? You know, so I think it's pretty exciting. And uh, I like the fact that the unknown is is way closer. It's also cool because you see a lot of bands, like you were saying, like who are, yeah, 15 years into their career like us. And from the outside, at least just from the outsider's perspective, they have frayed relationships. And there's things that are, you can see from the outside that, 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 are, that are not quite right dynamically. But then I look at our band as somewhat of a, of a, of a healthy marriage. Like, and you, as you said, like I do feel we are in our prime. Um, in terms of those things, I know the quality of songwriting is subjective. It's down to every everybody's you know individual opinion. I'm very happy with where we're at creatively in our career, but I think more importantly, like chemistry wise, in terms of our personalities, like we're in a good place, and and that's why I feel like hopeful that we have some gas left in the tank, you know. And I I know we're all like approaching the wrong side of forty now, and we're playing a young man's game even though we're becoming not so young men anymore. We're young in the grand scheme of things, but uh, I feel hopeful for the future, you know? And this is not something I ever wanted to do just for 10 years. This is something we've all wanted to do for like 30 years, 40 years, you know? Yeah, yeah. Give us the uh, long game. As long as these guys want to keep going, I'm in. Yeah, keep doing <laughs> yeah, it. Keep doing it. Yeah.
And please don't wait another seven years to come back to Italy. We are going to do our best. <laughs> yeah. okay. We'll be back next week. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, guys, for uh, this great interview. And I hope to see you very, very soon again. Thank you very much. Thank Grazie. You. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.